Welcome back to more Warhammer lore. In this video we will be delving into the Tomb Kings once again, however, this time focusing on the units in question and of course their lore background. I will also be interjecting on what distinguishes the Tomb Kings from the usual form of undead in the Vampire Counts. As usual, I will be comparing them to their recent implementation in Total War Warhammer 2 as a recent playable faction. So let's get into the lore proper, starting with the Tomb King's army as it is. For thousands of years, the Tomb Kings have lain dormant within their ancient burial pyramids, but now they have awoken from their slumber, determined to deliver dire vengeance upon those that would dare to disturb their rest. Loyal even in death, legions of skeleton warriors stride to war at the command of their mummified rulers. Beside them come regiments of undead horsemen. They gallop silently to the fray like ghosts of the ancient past. Ranks of mighty charioteers thunder behind them, their ornate armor and weapons of war, a gleaming example of the power and prestige they once knew in life. And finally, above these unliving warriors, towering war constructs carved in the image of monsters and gods stride before the battle line, ready to reenact the demand for slaughter given to them by their unliving master. With such a force at their command, the Tukun Tomb Kings have once conquered all who dared to stand against them, and they shall do so again. As a little note, the Tomb Kings actually do have a rather considerable fleet, mostly based out of Xandri, that aids them in their conquest of claiming their lost plundered treasures, as well as dealing the justice to the mortals that have slighted their honor in some way. Of course, most of these expeditions take place hundreds of years after said slight was committed, and so usually the offenders are long dead, and the current inhabitants of whichever unfortunate city they believe these mortals have come from suffer in their place. The Tomb Kings are a rather prideful lot, and don't really have much use for diplomacy or their lives of those that they should, by all rights, be serving them. It was in fact the duty of every soldier to serve his king, not only in life, but beyond into death. Countless thousands of loyal warriors were buried alive in the great tomb pits in the ancient kingdoms. Assembled in series ranks as though on parade, the legions of each king were entombed with all their weapons and regalia of war needed to protect their lord in the next life. Bronze-tipped spears, curved swords, and sturdy shields. Many archers were also buried with their masters, together with huge stockpiles of magically blessed arrows. Alongside the foot soldiery of the king's legions were regiments of cavalry and gilded chariots, which waited the day when they would gallop out of the mortuary pyramids and crush their enemies once again. When the Tomb Kings advance to war, they do so with these vast legions at their command, a breathtaking sight of gleaming bone, gold, and bronze. The undead warriors stride unflatteringly across the Syrian desert and through howling sandstorms as they close in on their foes. Vast phalanxes of skeletal soldiers advance towards their terrified enemies in relentless unison, fighting with a supernatural discipline that no mortal man can hope to match. Slowly but implacably, the legions of the undead drive their foes before them, guided as always by the unyielding will of their tomb king. There are some necromantic spells that reanimate long dead corpses, creating undead automatons that serve the necromancer in a mindless fashion. Such is not the way of the tomb king soldiers. Each skeleton in the numberless legion is inhabited by the souls of an ancient Nehekaran warrior. Now this is one of the major differences between the vampire counts and the tomb kings. The vampire count dead, for the most part, are relatively mindless and possess very little skill, with the exception of the grave guard and the aforementioned whites. However, the Tomb King's even basic skeletons retain the souls of the long dead, Nehekarn warriors, and therefore fight with more tenacity and skill, which is also why they are capable of performing complicated tasks such as steering a chariot and utilizing a bow and arrow. Another distinction we can glean from this is that the Tomb King units would be prepared for a different type of war, mostly fought in a desert and a forgotten age at this point in history. Therefore their weapons, armors, and tactics greatly differ from the modern battlefield techniques of some of the most industrious armies, such as the Men of the Empire. Also being warriors from a more bronze age of technology, even an elite regiment of Tomb Guard is going to be heavily under-armored when compared to even a basic infantryman of almost every other faction, as during their time, covering yourself in armor from head to toe was not exactly practical, and certainly not practiced amongst a desert battlefield under the beating rays of the Cimmerian sun. Through the magical incantations of the Lich Priests, spirits of loyal soldiers are summoned from the realm of souls and bound within corporeal remains. 
These warriors are not then slaves to the will of some evil wizard, but dutiful soldiers who unswearingly obey their king's command even in death, just as they once had in life. However, without the extensive mummification techniques and magical ward of preservation laid upon their bodies of the Nehekarn royalty, the skeletons of the Tomb King's legions perceived the world very differently to mortal men. They retain only the most pertinent aspects of their former lives, the endless years of training and discipline, the martial skills honed on countless fields of battle, and above all else, their oaths of fealty to their king. Personality and ambition are done without, and even their names have faded like half-forgotten dreams. Even in undeath, these warriors still fight in the same style that their forebears once fought when they too were still flesh and blood. The main component of the Tomb King's armies consists of legions of light infantry, skilled archers, swift cavalry, and mighty charioteers. Fighting like their forebears before them, the Tomb Kings rely heavily on the swiftness and flexibility of their armies to achieve victory. Using their regiments of light infantry as their core battle line, while a swift force of horsemen, horse archers, and charioteers run circles around the enemy, releasing hail upon hail of javelins and poison arrows to decimate their foes. This style of fighting would be very common amongst an ancient Bronze Age army, and probably would have been considered advanced when in comparison to the barbaric foes that they would have faced outside of their empire during their time period. As well, the infantrymen would be necessarily a holding force, not exactly a breaking force like you would in some of the more modern factions in Warhammer, and therefore their military regiments would be more specialized towards a defensive aspect, as they are completely reliant on their cavalry to break the enemy, much in the same way of the Bretonians, a very hammer and anvil technique. Now, the next aspect of their army is anything but natural, and something that they developed once they were awoken as the Tomb Kings. This was not carried over from their time as the Nehekarans of Kimri. Forming the mighty backbone of their armies are the war constructs, animated beings given life by the mortuary priests to serve and obey the commands of their Tomb Kings. They are large and imposing beasts of stone and marble, immune to emotion and pain, yet unyielding in its pursuit to cause destruction and mayhem to the enemies of the Tomb King. From beneath these behemoths, all manners of grotesque and living creatures crawl towards their enemy, as if they were called forth by the desert itself. Large poisonous beetles, massive vultures that can carry a knight and his horse into the air, and giant reanimated scorpions are but not one of the many creatures that can be seen in this harsh desert. Now, in the past, Constructs were used in warfare, as were most in most civilizations, usually in the form of simple war machines, such as catapults and ballista, but they would all change with the coming of Nagash and his great war. It was during this time that the engineers started focusing, um, the engineers of Libris, that is, would set down the roots of what are now the constructs of the Tumkin army. All of the current constructs are either based off of the various gods and guardians of the Tomb King Pantheon, or based off of the mighty soldiers and previous blessings of the gods the Tomb Kings held before the desecration of their link with their deities by the treacherous and ever-living necromancer Nagash. And for all of you interested in Nagash, I will one day, I'm not going to promise when, I will one day eventually get into a full Nagash timeline. I don't know if I'll go in end times, but I think I could definitely come up with a timeline as of right now and give you guys a good idea of who he was, what he's all about, and kind of just so you can identify what he actually is because he is a rather mysterious and very malignant person, at least from what you read from the army books, but if you read into his lore and his novel lore at least, he's a very interesting character and I look forward to doing a full video on him. Now, with that all out of the way, I believe it is time to get into the actual roster itself. And where better to start than with the leaders of the Tomb King's armies, the Tomb King. By now, if you have seen my previous videos, you should have a decent understanding of what a Tomb King is. They are the former kings and occasionally queens of Nehekara, resurrected to rule over their lands once again. It is important to note that this outcome of being brought back to life to reign for eternity over their kingdoms was not exactly unexpected. In fact, it was the premier goal of the mortuary cult established by Setra in the First Dynasty. But they were supposed to be brought back in perfect bodies, ruling over land that equivalent of paradise. 
We know that in fact this did not happen, as the land is completely dead, and their bodies were withered corpses, dried out and desiccated by the ravages of time. So upon awakening, many tomb kings went completely insane, while many others showed rather unstable tendencies and even fits of rage and melancholy. This is all rather understandable, but it does paint these rulers as being rather prideful, and they seem to, for the most part, lack any empathy for the living, almost as if they are jealous of the vitality that they once had and by all rights deserve once again. We do in fact get the mighty Tomb King as our generic lord choice for our armies in Total War. He is a standard melee lord capable of taking a mount in the form of a skeletal horse, a chariot, and to my surprise, the mighty Kemrian War Sphinx, which is a fantastic mount. It's an awesome construct if you haven't seen one yet. Now, I did say Tomb King, there are no Tomb Queen Lord choices. That's how it was in Tabletop, and that's how it is in Total War right now. From what I understand, from what I've gleaned from the lore and my research, the Tomb Queens usually don't get a very high spot in the uh, the limelight, that is. With the exception of High Queen Kalida, which we will be getting into shortly. Now, the next lore choice in the Tabletop is that of the High Lich Priest of the Mortuary Cult. Now, I have gone into a rather great detail on the members of the Mortuary Cult in my Mortuary Cult video. So, for more detailed information, feel free to go back and watch that video. They are a standard casting lord, decently powerful, but otherwise unremarkable, other than being capable of utilizing the lore of Nehakara, which is a unique lore of magic exclusive to the Tomb Kings. Now, unfortunately, we did not receive the Lich High Priest as a Lord Choice, which I really do hope they add at some point, as even though CA has done quite a jo good job in making these individual generals feel very different, it would be nice for a little more diversity when choosing a Lord, so that you're not stuck with just a melee Lord. I would also like to have another option, a casting option, or maybe even a, um, a bow option, something of that sort. Now, I do realize that the bow option would not exactly be lore friendly, but then again, they have taken various um, divergences with previous factions, and why not implement something kind of fun, you know? Diverse the general pool just a tidbit. And of course, we also do have the legendary lord choices, being that of Cetra the Imperishable, a standard melee lord, if you can call the Great One a standard melee lord. We also have High Queen Kalida, one of the only female characters in the Tomb King roster, and the embodiment of the snake goddess Asaf. She is a duelist lord, so she's very good at focusing 1v1 on heroes and or lords, or even large monsters. Then we have Grand Hierophant Katep, a caster lord capable of being mounted on the mighty Casket of Souls. And finally we have Arkhan the Black. Probably one of my favorite characters in the lore, and a kind of caster melee hybrid, but he seems to be mostly focused on casting and total war for some reason, which I'm a little, uh, I'm a little torn on. I feel like he should be a much more hybrid lord than the um, than the other casters. And now we get into the heroes of the Tomb King roster, starting off with the Tomb Prince, which are the sons of the Tomb Kings. Each of the kings of ancient Ehekara had many heirs doubtless the results of their extensive harems, but only one could succeed their father to the throne. This was typically the second son of the king, for the firstborn was given to the gods to serve in the mortuary cult. The king's younger sons served as the generals and lieutenants of his armies and enforced his will over his subjects. Upon their deaths, they were entombed beside the great tomb chamber of their sovereign, an eternal council of war, waiting for the moment of awakening when they shall resume command of their undead legions. Now we did get the Tomb Prince as the standard melee hero in the Total War Warhammer edition of the Tomb Kings. He does have an anti-large bonus, making him ideal for taking down monsters and ever the cavalry. However, he is only capable of being mounted on either a skeletal steed or a chariot in Total War. Why in Tabletop, who he was also capable of being mounted on the Cameron War Sphinx, similar to the Tomb King himself. Now, I think this might have been a balanced decision, because otherwise it would have been a no-brainer. But they did have to balance out the power level in the game, and so I think that was a purposeful decision. I don't think they just neglected to um, implement that Cameron War Sphinx. 
And the next hero is the Lich Priest, which are the servants of the mortuary cult of ancient Ehekara, obsessed with both the veneration of the dead and the search for eternal life. The Lich Priests finally discovered a way they could live forever, however over the millennia of their unnatural lifespans, the Lich Priest's bodies have decayed, forcing them to use embalming techniques and other methods to keep their fragile corpse-like forms in one piece. Now, I have gone into much more detail on Lich Priest, so if you really want to know more about them, check out my Mortuary Cult video. Now, we did get Lich Priest in Total War, and they are able to utilize the Winds of Nehekara, Life, and Death. They also, in the campaign, you can get a special Lich Priest that uses the Lore of Shadow, which is very powerful. And yes, we do get the Lore of Life, which you might assume would be outright detrimental to an undead faction. But the Tomb Kings are not standard undead, and even from a lore perspective, this does make a quite a bit of sense. The Lich Priests can also be mounted on a skeletal steed, making them highly mobile. The next hero we get is the Tomb Herald, which is the personal champion and trusted bodyguard of a Tomb King, obedient to a fault. These mummified warriors cut down their lord's enemies without pause or hesitation slicing through flesh and bone with every strike until all their foes life dead or dying at their feet. Tomb Heralds were selected from the ranks of the elite Tomb Guard, devout warriors who had honed their skills through years of warfare. Every candidate for the rank of Tomb Herald first had to pass numerous trials of bravery and loyalty to prove worthy of such an honor. Anyone wishing to harm a Tomb King must first get past his Herald, a sworn bodyguard who moves to intercept a mortal blow, heedless of the danger. Tomb Herald was not just a bodyguard, however, but also a soul guard. His life was intrinsically bound to that of his charge, for upon his king's death, he was expected to slit his own throat and serve his monarch in the realm of souls. A Tomb Herald was then embalmed and buried at the right-hand side of his lord in order to watch over and protect the king's spirit for all eternity. The Tomb Herald's golden armor was placed over his death shroud and enchanted blade placed in his hand. Thus, when the Tomb Heralds awakened from their sarcophagus, their most loyal retainers, already standing at their side, ready to slay these liege lords and enforce his will over the lands once more. Now, we did not get the Tomb Herald in total war, and really I am not quite disappointed, as they serve a very similar role to that of the Tomb Prince, and honestly would have been a redundant inclusion, as they really don't have many unique traits other than perhaps being able to raise the melee and missile defense of your lord perhaps to simulate them taking the wounds of their liege lord and this is one of the very few units that was left out of the tomb king's roster ca did a very good job of implementing the uh, roster in its entirety this time around the next hero we have to look at are the necrotex which were the artisans of ancient ehekara they were not common laborers, but architects of extraordinary skill whose ambitions far outpaced what could be achieved in any normal lifespan. In death, the Necrotex have lost none of their frenetic drive. They are filled with a compulsive need to pull down their inferior, vulgar cities of their enemies and supplant them with the vast monuments of their own design. The skills of a Necrotect were in high demand, for every king needed monuments to pronounce his majesty and a vast tomb to house his mortal remains upon his death. Indeed, Necrotechs were so valued that upon completing their work, they were rewarded with a ritual execution, followed by an elaborate embalming ceremony. Many Necrotechs were entombed within the same pyramid they had built, buried with the tools of their trade and an intrinsically carved death mask made by their own hands. The reasoning behind their sacrifice was twofold. Firstly, the king would need artisans to fashion places of gold in his next life. Secondly, it ensured that no rival king could hire their services to commission a more elaborate tomb for themselves. Many necrotechs went to their graves willingly, perhaps for the honor of their beloved king, or because they were unable to live knowing that nothing they created would ever surpass their lord's tomb. Other necrotechs, the more practical ones, were those whose creative desire still burned strongly, tending to meet with unfortunate accidents, such as falling through rotten scaffolding, tripping on slippery stairwells, or just happening to drink poisoned wine. The necrotechs were stern taskmasters who oversaw tens of thousands of Nehekarns as they toiled under the blazing sun. 
Under their gaze, an army of masons carved huge slabs of rock out of cliff faces before vast columns of slaves dragged the stones across the desert and hauled them into position. All necrotechs were foul-tempered, and they would dispense summary punishment at the slightest provocation. They hated anything and anyone that threatened their art and death. Much of their work lies broken or damaged by the greed of tomb robbers and invading armies. Necrotechs have been driven to a blinding rage by the wanton destruction of their beloved masterpieces, and they have sworn to have revenge. In battle, Necrotechs lead the Tomb King's regiments like the Wart Gains of old. They exude the same aura of hatred they possessed in life, and their mere presence instills a magical state of fury in the undead warriors of Nehekara. Necrotechs no longer need to extort their followers to work faster, and they reserve the lash of those who would defile their art instead, attacking those ignorant wretches with the crack of a whip strong enough to split open backs and leave spines exposed to the elements. These guys essentially are the architects and taskmasters of Nehekarn society, and they did make it into a Warhammer, much in the same way as they are described. They're primarily used to buff and heal your constructs instead of giving your regular troops a buff of any kind taking the already dangerous hammers in your army and fortifying them to complete killing machines. Heedless of damage as they can easily recoup their losses, he can also be taken on a skeleton chariot as a mount. And it is interesting to note that I was reading some Reddit threads and people were commenting on the skeletons, the skull faces in the mountains. And if you do read the Lord, such as the Necrotech, you would know that the Nehekarans were fascinated with death and therefore they actually carved skeleton faces into the mountains and it was just part of their culture. And so those, of course, would still be here today, much in the same way as Mount Rushmore, let's say, in the U.S., and now that we are through the heroes, let's get into the infantry of the Tomb Kings. First up are the Skeleton Warriors, which are ancient and eternally loyal warriors who have willingly followed their mighty rulers into death, forming the very core of all Nehekaran armies. Rising up from the dusty dunes, rank upon rank of the Skeleton Warriors stand ready to kill once more in the names of their mortal monarchs holding curved swords and long spears. Ancient forms awaken from their deathly slumbers, forming up in vast regiments with a supernatural discipline that few living warriors can hope to match. The mighty armies of Nehekara, made up of regiment of regiment of valiant soldiers, swore oaths to eternally loyalty before their gods to serve their monarch in life and beyond in death. Now we do get two varieties of skeletal warriors in Total War, a Kopesh and Shield variety, essentially a sword and shield, and a spear and shield variety. They are extremely similar to the Vampire Count variants of the same name, except they appear to have much better melee defense stats, and will grind out just a little bit longer than the Vampire Counts. And next we come to a unit that CA actually created for Total War as a stopgap between standard skeletons and the Tomb Guard, known as Nehekaran Warriors. This is a little redundant, as technically even the skeletons are considered Nehekarn warriors, but the difference CA has added is that this unit dual wields their Kopeshes and have a rather decent anti-infantry bonus, making them ideal for carving through lightly armored troops, as well their stats have all improved over the standard skeleton warriors. Now we get into the next infantry units in the Tomb King roster being the Tomb Guard which are the bravest and best soldiers, served as bodyguards for the ancient kings of Nehekara. Elevation to the ranks of the Tomb Guard were perhaps the only way that a warrior not of noble birth could ever hope to enter the royal palace. The Tomb Guard lived in comparative luxury, each having a dozen slaves to tend to their war gear, so they could keep their attentions focused on their sacred duties, the preservation of the king's life and dominion. However, Worldly wealth was the least reward granted to these warriors, for in respect of their position, they were honored with the privilege of sharing in their king's mortality. Upon their death, or that of their lords, they were mummified by the lich priests and buried in close proximity to their king's sarcophagus. Just as they guarded the palace in life, so now they guard the inner sanctum of the necropolis in death. The prospect of sharing in the eternal beauty and immortality of their king and serving him for all time inspired these soldiers to do heroic acts of bravery. They would die where they would stood rather than retreat and charge against the most hopeless odds without thought of their own survival. 
Time and again, this selfless heroism would bring victory to the king's army and earn a place in his pyramid for the honored fallen. The tomb guard were entombed with their armor and weapons. Their bodies were further decorated with gold bracelets, headdresses, and scarab-shaped brooches that fastened parchment proclaiming their deeds of bravery and devotion. The tomb guards rest until awakened, and their stone sarcophagus arranged upright and through the royal tomb chamber of their king. Though they stand to attention as palace guards until the time comes when they are again needed, if intruders violate the tomb, they will awaken and defend their slumbering lord. If the king rouses from his death sleep, ready to go forth to conquer the lands of the living, they arise and form an honor guard at his side. Although the tomb guard were rewarded with a form of mummification, the embalming rituals used were nowhere near as elaborate as the ceremonies that the tomb kings and tomb princes underwent. However, the tomb guard have been reborn with immortal bodies far stronger and more resilient than the flesh and blood forms they wore in life. Furthermore, tomb guard retain more of their former personalities than the mass soldiery of skeletal warriors. They awaken with memories of heroic deeds, bloody victories, and the unyielding will to destroy their king's enemies still burning strongly in their minds. Above all, they remember their duty to protect their tomb king from harm, and any that threaten their charge or slain cut down without pause. Now we did get the tomb guard in Total War, and they make up the most elite troops the tomb kings offer. They come in a standard Kopesh and Shield variety, and a Halbert variety with an anti-large bonus. They are the tomb kings most elite infantry. Now it is important to note that they do not match well against other elite infantry of other factions, and will lose pretty much hands down but not before inflicting considerable casualties, as they do tend to have a very high melee defense, aiding them in a longer drawn out conflict than most other units. And now we get into the infantry skirmishers of the Tomb King roster, the only one being the skeleton archers. There was a strong tradition of archery in ancient Ehekara, and hunting was a popular sport amongst young princes. However, Upon reaching adulthood, a prince was expected to leave behind such pastimes and devote his life to ruling his people. It became tradition for a newly crowned king to honor the greatest marksman amongst his legion with his royal bow. The chosen warriors were bestowed the title of Master of Arrows, a position that held much prestige among the common soldiery. However, it was said that should the Master of Arrows miss his target the first time he fired the bow on the field of war, his life was forfeit. Such was the punishment for betraying the king's trust. Every arrow fired by a skeleton archer of Nehekara has been blessed by Asaf, goddess of vengeance and magic, so that they seek out their foes with unerring accuracy. When loosed, the arrow swerve in midair, darting towards their prey with the speed of striking snakes. The ritual bestowing each arrow with Asaf's blessing is long and arduous. The wooden shafts are inscribed with incantations, using the claws of doomed scorpions and the black feathers of desert vultures, and used to fletch them. The most important part of the ritual is performed by chanting acolytes in the heart of Asaf's sacred temples, where bronze arrowheads are cooled in the blood of a hundred sacrificed serpents. Much like their tabletop equivalent, the skeleton archers of Total War are a rather accurate for not having any actual eyeballs. They have fairly decent range, and more importantly, being undead, they do not break when they come under fire. They simply volley back until they are consumed and return to dust making them a rather potent counter skirmishing force. And now we have finally made it to the cavalry portion of the Tomb King army, starting with the skeletal horsemen. Unencumbered by heavy armor or barding, a Tomb King skeletal cavalry legions maintain a punishing pace as they traverse the scorching deserts of Nehekara. Skeletal horsemen often form the spearhead of a Tomb King's army, and as such they are amongst the first of the undead warriors to engage their foe. These vanguard warriors are not heavily armored knights, but fearless riders who launch devastating attacks when their opponents are weakest, luring the enemy into overextending their reach before withdrawing to strike again. However, skeleton horsemen are not completely without protection, for they carry large, sturdy shields in battle to deflect the panic blows of their foes. Cavalry were a relatively late addition to the armies of ancient Ehekara, for horses needed a great deal of water to survive the desert heat. As such, steeds were expensive, worth considerably more than the soldiers who rode them. Only those warriors who had proven themselves in slaying a dozen foes in mortal combat were inducted into the ranks of one of the king's valued cavalry legions. These warriors would then spend the rest of their lives fighting from the saddle, 
drilled under the tutelage of their king's masters of horse. A grizzled veteran bearing the scars of several bloody campaigns in life, these champions often form part of the Tomb King's Council of War, for their knowledge and experience of mounted warfare were second to none and their expertise was highly valued. We do get the skeleton horsemen in Total War as a standard light cavalry with a spear and no shield, unfortunately, but we did get a further variant much like the infantry in the Nehekarn horsemen, who utilize a Kopeshan shield and have a bonus towards infantry, making them have rather impressive stats for a so-called medium cavalry. And now we move on to the skeleton chariots. Nehekara was the first great civilization of mankind, and the place where men first used horses and chariots in battle. This was a great accomplishment, for horses had only recently been bred as beasts of war, but it was considered wrong for those of noble blood to touch such lowly beasts, let alone ride them. However, with the invention of the chariot, the ruling classes of Nehekara could take a to battle with the speed of a stallion. The ancient armies of Nehekara included vast forces of swift chariots, and each carried an arsenal of weaponry. To fight from such an armored platform was thought to be the height of civilized warfare. As such, only royalty and nobility were permitted to fight as charioteers, as befitted their status. Charioteers were bedecked in fine armor, precious metals, and valuable jewels. The chariots were created by skilled artisans, often gilded in gold and covered with images of skulls, bones, and other symbols of the mortuary cult. The fighting quality of the king's charioteers was a reflection of his own power and martial prowess. As such, the king entrusted the training of these regiments to the master of chariots. These sacred warriors were typically a minor blood relation to the royal family, such as a cousin, and thus had the aristocratic superiority to back up their years of fighting experience. The master of chariots was a ruthless disciplinarian, and under his command, the noble-born charioteers were drilled until they were elite warriors fit to fight in the king's army. They would ride into battle, fierce and proud, the legion's standard carried high as they bore down upon their foes. We also are seeing the skeleton chariots in Total War, but unlike most chariots already in other factions, the Doom Kings don't seem to be terribly armor piercing. Now they do have a considerable charge bonus, and they have more models than a normal chariot unit, being that they have 9 models to the standard 3 of most factions, making them a rather potent for light infantry, and they do decent against heavy infantry if you can get flanks and rear charges on them. Next, we have a skirmishing cavalry in the Skeleton Horse Archers, which were originally bandits of a kind that plagued many of the Nehekaran deserts. But such was their skill on horseback that they were said to have been born in the saddle, and their marksmanship, unhindered by the jarring motion of their galloping mounts, was renowned throughout Nehekara. The Tomb Kings, back then the Simple Kings, had great need of such warriors and guides, and they would pay much gold to hire the services as mercenaries. It was not until the reign of Rakoth III of the Second Dynasty that horse archers became a permanent feature in the armies of Nehekara. Rakoth granted these tribes the freedom of the desert and the protection of his grand armies and as much gold as their chieftains could carry. In exchange for an annual tithe of warriors who would swear an oath of unswearing loyalty and obedience to their king. Ever since then, the King Javenshin and Hakara maintained strong contingents of horse archers amongst their armies. Skeleton horse archers are the outriders and scouts of the Tomb King's army, whereas mortal heroes need regular rest and water, skeletal steeds across the vast tracts of open desert at a relentless pace. Even in death, these undead horsemen maintain an innate ability to track and hunt their quarry through the shifting dunes. No sandstorm can obscure the targets from them. As scouts, skeletal horse archers hinder the movements of the enemy and harass their flanks in fleeting yet bloody skirmishes. These attacks do much to slow the advance of the Tomb King's enemies, pinning them in place while the Tomb King maneuvers his own warriors into position. Skeleton horse archers are also included in Total War and function similarly to horse archers of any other faction really, with the benefit of much like the standard Tomb King archers, that they will not rout from a fight, but simply crumble and fight to the last man. The next cavalry unit is almost a construct, but not quite, so I think it deserves to be in this category. The Necropolis Knights. Now, Necroserpents were built to guard the entranceways of the Mortuary Cult's temples. They are vast in stature, and even coiled they stand at least twice the height of a man. 
though the necro serpent standing sentinel outside some mortuary temples to pick images of skull vipers or double-headed blood and asps, the vast majority of these statues are created in the image of a hooded Cameron cobra, for Kuaf, the Henehekarn god of cobras, took this as his corporeal form in the great land before the coming of man. The god would lie in ambush beneath the surface of the desert before lunging towards his prey and sinking his spear-sized fangs into their scaly throats. The venom of the Cameron Cobra is so potent that even a single drop is enough to kill a dozen war horses or scores of fully grown men. Those bitten die with a rictus grin of agony on their faces as every muscle in their body contracts to the point where their own bones and teeth snap and break. The fangs of the necro serpents mysteriously drip with this very same poison. When faced with the dishonor of exile, many committed ritual suicide, but some instead chose an agonizing death for a chance to serve their king again in his eternal army. These brave soldiers would slit their palms and smear blood onto the belly of one of these giant necro serpents before holding the wound under the venom dripping from their fangs. As the poison racked their bodies, it was believed that Kuaf would judge their souls, and those that were found worthy would be reborn in the next life as Necropolis knights, warriors blessed with the skill, power, and strength of the gods. Upon their death, these elite warriors were mummified and buried with their full penelope of war beneath the very same statue that they had sacrificed themselves before. Which, this is a very interesting way to present this unit as it did not exist in the regular Kemrian fashion. They were not riding giant snakes, and as you can see, the snakes are actually constructs. They're not living snakes that were just brought back to life. Now, in Total War, the Necropolis Knights are surprisingly fast for what they are essentially heavily armored cavalry. They also come in an anti-large variant that has a halberd for dealing with opposing cavalry or any other large monsters. It is interesting that these are more so designed by the Lich Priests rather than the Necrotex, which is what you would normally expect that pretty much all of the constructs were made by the Necrotex, but not the case with two of them, this being one of them, the Necropolis Knights. And now let's move into the monstrous units. The first of which we will cover is the Carrion, which are terrifying undead birds of prey that resemble giant reanimated vultures, which feast upon the carcasses of those that have fallen within the lands of Nehekara. The broad wings covered in feathers as black as midnight darken the sky and spread about the shadow of doom upon those dying the, in the desert. These undead birds can smell blood from leagues away, and they are drawn to battlefields like moths to flame. Wherever carrion are seen to fly, death and carnage are surely nearby. Almost sounded like a poem there. According to inscriptions, the carrion were sacred beasts, agents of Ulatep, the vulture godded head of scavengers who bore the spirits of lost warriors to the sky to fight in endless battles against the demons of darkness. This belief led to the mortuary cult burying corpses of carrion in the necropolis, entombing many thousands of them within the pyramids of the tomb kings from the time of Neheketh I, who claimed to be the first ruler to use carrion in his army of eternity and onwards. From these ancient corpses, the carrion would once more fly across the skies of Nehekara to feast once more. Now, to my surprise, Carrion actually made it into Total War, and they actually are not half bad, almost an equivalent to harpies in harassing and damaging skirmishers, or used an, an aggressive flanking force of a kind, or a holding force, if you may, almost like Felbats. And then we run into the Tomb Swarm, which are simply swarms of insects and other various desert creatures, some poisonous, and they are not ex actually a playable unit like any other swarm unit has been for any other faction so far, but they are actually in the game as a spell you can use to damage enemy units similar to Flock of Doom from the Lore of Beasts, and you can utilize them in the campaign missions at least. Um, I'm not sure about multiplayer. Now let's move on to the final what I consider monster unit being the Tomb Scorpion, which also serve as a sarcophagus for the shell of each construct is formed around the cadaver body of an ancient lich priest. Although lich priests are unable to die a natural death, many have perished through wounds sustained in battle. Those that fall are embalmed and interred within a tomb scorpion. Canopic jars containing their vital organs, or what withered remains are often left of them, are embedded within the scorpion tombs in a ritualistic pattern that symbolizes death. However, 
Some remnants of a lich priest spirit always remains trapped within the mummified corpse. Through incantations, these embers are rekindled, infusing the inanimate shells of the tomb scorpions with power. This magical source also provides tomb scorpions with a degree of protection against spells of enemy wizards, whose sorceress bolts of energy unravel and fade as they are absorbed harmlessly by the undead construct's carapace. Each scorpion, shaped sarcophagus, is inscribed with hieroglyphs of preservation and a ceremony of awakening the spoken by a lich priest to animate them. If the ritual has been performed correctly, the tomb scorpion will become infused with the residual power of the corpse within it. The ritual is exceptionally complex and lasts from the moonrise until the first rays of dawn. The slightest mistake or mispronunciation can have dire consequences as a swarm of undead scorpions may burst out of the desert and sting the lich priest to death, or desert spirits may turn the wizard's body inside out and feast on his withered remains. At the very least, the ritual will fail and must be recited from the very beginning. Occasionally, despite every syllable being uttered correctly, some of the ancient ones no longer respond to the incantations of awakening. That these constructs are truly dead is doubtful, as a spark of power can still be felt radiating from their carapaces. Rather, it is sought by the binding their souls to their mortal plane, the Lich Priest cheated the god of the underworld out of his rightful due. Thus, it is thought that the jealous deity is not always willing to give up his long-awaited prizes by allowing their spirits of the Lich Priest to leave the realm of souls. The mighty Tomb Scorpion has made its way into Total War, and it is exceptionally good at killing armored infantry, and even half-decent at fighting lords and heroes, as it has very good armor-piercing values and a very decent weapon strength. That is it for the monsters, so let's get into the artillery. Starting with the Screaming Skull Catapults, of a Tomb King's Eternally Army, are akin to the stone throwers of other races. But instead of flinging rocks at their foe, they throw volleys of flaming skulls. The Lich Priest cast terrible curses upon every one of these skulls, enchanting them so that they scream hideously as they are hurled through the air, rising to a deafening crescendo just before they strike their target. These are the very death screams of the skulls' former owners, the welling shrieks of those slaughtered on the field of battle, and the agonized cries of prisoners captured at the moment of their execution. Many battle-hardened warriors are driven to the edge of insanity by the blood-curdling sound. The horrific ammunition bursts into hellish ethereal flames when it is launched, and as the skulls arc through the air, they blaze an eerie trail of green fire behind them. Most of these skulls explode on impact, sending fragments of splintered bone in all directions and engulfing those nearby in a wash of bale fire. Others smash into their target with horrifying force, eternal flames spilling out of an empty eye socket as the skulls chew through armor and warm flesh alike. Every screaming skull catapult is crewed by a trio of skeleton warriors. They load and fire their war machines with silent efficiency, unperturbed by the dreadful sound of their ammunition. The artisans of ancient Nehekara were wrought screaming skull catapults into their very image of destruction. The catapults' arms were shaped to resemble twisted bones, and their cradles were fashioned into vast skeletal claws, and so-called hands of death. The chassis of the catapult was carved to resemble the skeletal remains of a vicious desert predator, and sprouting from their spines are great towers of skulls. These are the remains of enemy champions, nailed to the mast of the catapult and grisly trophies. When they wail in perpetual torment until plucked from their fastenings and fired at the enemy, even the stoutest heart trembles with fear knowing that such a fate awaits them should they fall against the tomb kings. King Behedesh of Zandri was the inventor of the Screaming Skull Catapult, and he offered many to be built during his reign. He used these extensively in many wars, and most famously to defeat the rulers of Araby who rebelled against him. These treacherous kings refused to submit to Behagadish well, but when their armies were bombarded by the skulls of their own comrades, they fled and their cities burned. At every battle's end, the catapult crew scoured the battlefield for bodies of slain foes, decapitating the they found and carrying the severed heads back to be cursed by Zandri's lich priests. However, such was not the fate of the rebel kings. Bahadesh decreed that these traitors were to be mummified alive and strapped the top to his catapults so that they could watch the destruction of their cities firsthand. Even now, many centuries later, some catapults still have withered corpses bound to their timbers. Whether these are the same renegades that opposed Bahakdesh, or the remains of other tormented souls has long been forgotten. 
Occasionally a muffled sound, as faint as the rustling of dried parchment, ushers from their cadaver slips, begging for mercy. However, the skeleton crews are oblivious to their pleas, and even if they were not, they could not be heard over the banshee wailing of their ensorcelled ammunition. As you can see, this is a very devastating weapon, though in the tabletop, it is not so much a physically damaging artillery piece as it is mostly demoralizing in nature. Similar to the plate claw catapult of the Skaven, in Total War, for some reason, it does not have this effect, but it does do high armor-piercing damage and also has an anti-infantry bonus like most catapults. Now, the lore behind this is just... it's awful. <laughs> it's pretty terrible. It's probably one of the worst ones that I've really delved into so far. But there is more to come. There is always more to come. And now we move on to the Casket of Souls which is a mighty magical sarcophagus used by the Tomb Kings to capture and then summon forth the spirits of those that have tried to defile the lands of Nehekara, only to die a horrid and agonized death. At the heart of each tomb of the mightiest kings, there lies a casket, filled with pitch and inscribed with hieroglyphs of malediction and warning. Within the sacred sarcophagus resides the tormented souls, those who have committed the sacrilege of inciting the Tomb Kings' wrath. Whether consumed by ravenous tomb swarms or cut down by the tomb guard, the spirits of those thus condemned have been ensnared by the dire power of the casket and trapped within it for eternity. Powerful binding inscriptions assert that these souls cannot leave their prison until the moment when the casket is opened. The casket of souls is not physically carried into battle, but it is summoned through the incantations of a keeper of a casket, a priest of the mortuary cult whose sole responsibility is the custodianship of the revered object. As a keeper of the casket intones the proper chants, a mountain of skulls bursts from the ground below. These gush forth, forming into a mound that spills over, the, revealing the casket of souls atop a dais of bone. Within a nimbus of sorcerous energy, swollen around its infernal form, and two undead guardians by its side. The power surrounding the casket of souls is such that nearby lich priests can infuse their incantations with a portion of its energy. When the seals are broken, and the lid of a casket of souls is opened, blinding light spills across the battlefield as countless souls scream into the air, seeking freedom from the madness and torment of their confinement. Such an escape will never come while the casket is intact, for the pull of the damned sarcophagus is so great that it draws the souls back within no matter how hard they try to fight it. Crazed and desperate, these insubstantial spirits plunge through the hearts and minds of the Tomb King's enemies. Hopelessly seeking to escape, and the screaming forms of these souls pass through the physical bodies of living creatures, the life force of the creature is sucked dry. They feel an intense pain deep within them, and their bodies age centuries with every passing second. In mere heartbeats, they are little more than a dried shell, and they fall to the ground. To die thus is far worse than any physical death, for the very souls of those who perish in this manner become ensnared by the power of the casket, becoming just another of the countless lost souls held within its unholy confines for an eternity of torment. The casket of souls is a devastating weapon, for all who look upon it risk eternal damnation and imprisonment. These spirits affect even creatures that do not truly age or have souls, as the magical energies that bind them together or keep them on this plane of existence are absorbed. Only the attendant keeper knows the incantations that will open the casket, and if he is interrupted, the souls of the damned are instantly sucked back inside. If the casket of souls is ever destroyed, the tortured souls will escape their confines in a raging maelstrom of destruction, feeding on anything caught in their magical black glass as they wreak their vengeance. Now, this is considered a construct for some reason in the army book, but in Total War, the devastating Casket of Souls has made its debut. It is a horrifically long-ranged artillery piece shooting magical soul bombs into mass clumps of infantry, though it also excels at damaging single units at a mid to close range to rather considerable effect. It also supplies winds of magic for any casters you may have in your army as per the slight little lore blurb on it, kind of strengthening the winds of magic for any local um, casters. And now we have finally made it into the mighty constructs of the Tomb Kings. And we will start off with the Ushapti. It was the ancient Ahakarn's belief that their gods and goddesses dwelt in the great land before the birth of man. 
It's said that the span of these deities' lives numbered in the thousands of years. After the Golden Era, when gods walked as men, they became invisible spirits able to take on any form they desired. Thus it was that Asaf, the beautiful goddess of invention and magic, chose the form of an asp, while others chose the crocodile, the lion, the vulture, or some other fearsome animal of the desert. Most depictions of these gods in the Grand Pantheon show them in these powerful forms, as their visages are commonly carved as guardians, Ushapti, in the necropolis of Nehekara. Some of the most common statues depict the image of Jajaf, the jackal-headed god of war and the dead, the Pakath, the hawk-faced deity of the sky, whose piercing gaze is said to be able to see the sins of the deceased, sculpted from stone, marble, and even jade. These magnificent statues is decorated with filigree gold and dazzling polished jewels. The rituals needed to animate these towering god statues are far more difficult than those needed to awaken the legions of skeleton warriors. As a result, Shapti are far more resilient than the skeleton warriors of the Tomb King's Eternal Army, and their warrior spirits are bound with far more powerful magic. In the ancient language of Nehekara, the name Ushapti translates literally as Chosen of the Gods. Indeed, the divinities do not consent to any mere mortal inhabiting statues made in their image, only the most powerful souls, those of particularly brave warriors and heroic champions are just worthy of enough to animate an Ushapti's sculpted form. Thus, Ushapti are possessed by the souls of Nehekarn's mightiest heroes. Ushapti stride through the battlefield like gods of war, infused with the temperament and strength of their form's pantheon deity. Their statuesque bodies can withstand enormous damage, and they are incredibly strong with a single hand, and Ushapti is capable of crushing an enemy's steel helmet and its contents with contemptuous ease. It is also with note that the Ushapti were not always constructs. In the days of old, before the treachery of Nagash, Ushapti were actually living, breathing, blessed men that served in their king's armies. They would take on the appearance of their deity and exude an aura of power. However, this was all changed once Nagash severed the link between the Kemrians and their deities, and now only these statues remain in their likeness. It is also important to note that Ushapti can be made by anyone with the know-how. As a celestial wizard, in the desperate attempt to stop Warfleck the Wanderer from claiming his head, made one of these creatures within the confines of the Empire. Now, as far as Total War is concerned, the Ishapti are fantastic additions. They do armor piercing damage and are highly armored as you would have expected. Plus, the animations for all the constructs are very well done. Now, the Ishapti do come in two variants in Total War. The standard dual wielding infantry and a great bow variant that shoot armor-piercing missiles that seem to explode in the shrapnel above the heads of enemy troops in a most devastating fashion indeed. Next we have the Sepulchral Stalkers, which are massive reanimated sentinels created by the ancient Ehekarians to patrol their borders of a king's realm. Over the centuries, the Sepulchral Stalkers have been swallowed by the shifting sands of the desert and they are now lie hidden beneath the dunes. Sepulchral Stalkers are statues that have the body of a snake and the upper torso of a man. Atop these statues, curved spines sit in human skulls, inside which glow eerie, baleful lights. Lying beneath the surface of the desert, they wait for intruders to pass by before launching a desperate ambush. When the trap is sprung, several horrifying snake-like forms burst from the ground to surround their prey. The Sepulchral Stalkers impale their foes on ornate staves before they even realize they are under attack. However, it is not the skill with which they wield these weapons that sepulchral stalkers are so feared, for those who gaze into their eyes are turned into pillars of sand. Standing as still as statues until a gust of wind blows them apart and scatters the grain into the desert. To look upon a sepulchral stalker is literally to look to your own death. Now it is important to note that these sepulchral stalkers are actually the souls of Nehekarn warriors, whose bodies were destroyed beyond reanimation and they were then binded into these now sentient machines. Now, as far as Total War is concerned, I think CA did a very good job of implementing the stare ability, almost like a Medusa ability, as a high damage magic attack. And it is very good at taking down large targets, especially if they can all get a good line of sight. And as well, they are a very good anti-large contingent of essentially heavy cavalry, although they do have a very low model count. And then we have the Kemrian War Sphinx. War Sphinx were first constructed in Kemri to guard the entranceways to the king's inner sanctums, 
Over time, the rulers of the other cities demanded similar guardians, and before long, war sphinxes stood sentry within every burial pyramid. Here, inside the vast amphitheater's chambers, they are said to roam, preying on intruders while the king slumbers. Some kings even had a war sphinx constructed to stand over them and their own sacred sarcophagi, and they were especially lavish and ornate. Upon awakening, a tomb king could ride his royal war sphinx in a battle, leading his army out of the burial chambers and into the binding light of day. As with any Nehekarn sculpture, no two Cameron war sphinx are quite the same. The Necrotechs were always looking to build grander and more impressive creations than those of their predecessors. Some war sphinxes have scorpion tails filled with potent venom, while others breathe fire, emulating their foes in blazing conflagrations. It is rare indeed for a new Cameron War Sphinx to be constructed, and most of those that are seen prowling alongside the Tomb King's armies have existed for thousands of years. If one of these giant constructs is somehow destroyed in battle, its sacred pieces are gathered up by skeletal working gangs and dragged back to the cities of Nehekar to be restored and re-sculpted by the Necrotex of the Necropolis. The War Sphinx is also said to be rather cat-like in battle, springing about and crushing the enemy underfoot which Sihei has once again nailed, as you can immediately tell that this thing's animations were based off of some cat. Now, it is a armor-piercing anti-infantry construct that is exceptionally tanky, capable of distracting and possibly decimating high numbers of troops, and can be a mount for your standard Tomb King. Next, we have the Mighty Necrosphinx, which is a bizarre and horrifying statue. A strange amalgamation of the mythical beasts that are said to inhabit the Nehekarn underworld, maintaining order amongst the honored dead. An Exor Sphinx has a torso and face of a man, and is armed with gigantic scything blades that can sever the neck of a dragon in a single slice. Many also have a scorpion-like tail, better enabling them to stand sentry against the predations of evil. Finally, sprouting from the statue's back are a pair of ornate wings which mimic those of the falcons that circle of the highest levels of the underworld, keeping watch so that the souls of the damned may not escape. The Lich Priests do not think that a Necrosphinx is animated by the souls of valiant warriors like those of other war statues that walk beside the Tomb King's skeletal legions. Instead, they believe that the sinister gods, Fafaf and Husef, breathe life into these horrifying creations. These malevolent deities are said to dwell within mighty tombs beneath the sands, buried by the other gods for their destructive ways. And the lich priests are right, then the mysterious gods have finally found a means by which to vent their fury upon the world. Whatever the truth, deep within every necrosphinx is the burning need to destroy, and the incantations of servitude laid upon them are the only things that keep them from turning upon their creators and tearing Nehekarn asunder. The Necrosphinx is the Tomb King's equivalent to a Dragon Ogre Shagath. They are massive and excel at hunting monsters and large entities, as well as just being in generally terrifying. They are one of the best units for this particular job in the Tomb King's roster and have a massive health pool. And yes, they did make it into Total War like nearly the entirety of the Tomb King's roster, except for the next unit. The Necrolith Colossus. In ancient times before the rise of Cetra and the Mortuary Cult, many were the legends of mighty beings of immense stature walking the land and smiting all who stood in their path. Nehekaros gods to stand watch over the lands, immortal sentinels who would guard their realms against the evil demons. So it is thought that the most ancient of the Necrolith Colossus were created by the gods themselves. However, the ancient Nehekarns constructed countless more, hewing their forms from mighty pillars of rock and carving them directly into the faces of cliffs and pyramids. Every necropolis in Nehekara is now watched over by at least one of these imposing figures. Outside the ancient cities, Necroth Colossi stand as motionless figures, guarding important valleys, entrances, and gateways from rampaging monsters and any warbands for aeons at a time. As the skill of the priesthood grew, they turned their talents towards binding the souls of Nehekarns for most warriors into these vast statues, for who could face such a creation in battle? The incantations of summoning required were long and arduous, demanding the combined power of a score of lich priests, such as the magic instilled into Necroth Colossus that upon spirits are bound within their mighty frames, they will never again need the incantations of a lich priest that prompt them into wakefulness. 
Necroth Colossi will react immediately to the presence of unwelcome strangers and move to strike them down. Stirring from their vigil, they shake loose the sand and dust that had settled in their immense forms and stride relentlessly toward the intruders. A Necroth Colossus is armed with the traditional weapons and armor only on a massive scale, carrying vast bows or giant swords that stand taller than a troll. A Necroth Colossus is a supremely powerful foe, and its weapons can carve through an armored knight and its barded steed in a single stroke. In battle, they are terrifying to behold. The desert itself trembles at their passing, the impacts of their heavy footfalls sounding a mighty drumbeat that heralds impending doom. They are nigh impossible to stop, crushing foes beneath their feet and sending dead and broken bodies flying in all directions. This is the only unit besides the Tomb Champion um, that did not make the cut for Total War. They are essentially bone giants, but giants wielding massive practical weapons, not just clubs like the majority of giants in Warhammer World, and they even function as mobile artillery as essentially their bows is considered a ballista. Now we did get the Ushapti with great bows, so the Tomb Kings still have their extreme range in armored piercing, but it would have been cool to see this thing in action, almost like a Saigor from the Beastman roster. There is always hope that it could be added later, but it is not at the top of my list as there are several much more iconic and substantial missing units in the previous implemented races in Warhammer that need to be visited before the Colossus, though seeing the giant Colossus wielding a Ballista would be fantastic as well. And that is it for the army roster. So let's get a brief summary in of the Tomb Kings army before we close this out. The Tomb Kings as a whole function much in the same way as any ancient army from the Bronze Age would from our own world. The infantry line is not terribly armored and is fielded in massive numbers in hopes of either overrunning the enemy or just slowing them down enough that the archers and chariots can break the flanks and attack the rear of the enemy. They are extremely reliant on mobility, which is unusual for an undead faction. That is until you factor in the extravagant artillery and the devastating constructs. The Tomb Kings are a very high risk, high reward faction, where victory and defeat hang upon which constructs are brought to a battle and how well you can deploy the various magical lores to augment the lackluster performance of the standard infantry. So, in summary, they are a very interesting and unique faction in, in Warhammer and probably one of my favorites if I'm being honest. Now this is actually all I've got for you today on the Tomb Kings army. It has been a long video, I apologize for that. But before you go, I would like to say thank you to all of my loyal subscribers. You are the reason I continue to make lore content and I do appreciate all of the positive feedback. It just shows that we have a very positive and self-conscious community growing on this channel and I do appreciate all of you for that. If you are in fact new to the channel, I do encourage you to both like this video, as it does help these videos be seen by more people, and subscribe if you want to keep up with the any lore content or just any content I've got coming out in the near future. And for all of that, I do appreciate all of you guys once again. And as always, I have been Jumbo Thick. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all again very soon. Have a good day.